And uh, welcome to the class uh, called Critical Race Theory and the Politics of Teaching About Racism. Uh, initially, we talked about uh, putting together a class about critical race theory, but in fact, uh, it was important to think about uh, not only exploring that issue, but what it means to us in terms of the way we relate to history, the, the way we educate our youth, the way we deal with uh, issues that, that affect race. Uh, and so that's why we expanded the course and uh, this course subject. And this also was a, an idea of Ellen Efros, who was uh, with the curriculum committee of ILR. And uh, she and I sort of came up with the idea at the same time, but uh, we're happy to have uh, so many just powerful speakers uh, in this uh, course. So let me introduce the course as a whole. Um, one of the major accomplishments of the government in the US has been the development of public education. However, for over 100 years, governments and school boards have faced challenges in defining the goals and objectives of the school system, as well as the contents of curricula. Such decisions were made in a political context, reflecting compromises between the latest understanding of subjects and the educational objectives. Parents, children, and those without children are all stakeholders in the public education system. They also are stakeholders in public colleges and university. What's taught in schools and universities matters to everyone. One of the most contentious areas for curricular development has been the teaching of history. What information perspectives do we want young people to learn at different ages? In a country that embraced slavery of black people from the beginnings of European settlement and accepted discrimination and residential segregation as part of daily life, it's been a challenge to teach about race. Historians have learned an enormous amount about the role of race in America, the efforts of people of multiple races to achieve social and legal equality, and the adjustment of government and societal institutions to these changes. The degree to which these lessons have been integrated into curricula depends upon political decisions. Today, many Americans and government leaders believe that schools are overemphasizing racial discrimination in their history curricula. Many of these people believe that the country's history of racism should be de-emphasized and that the achievements of white Americans should be highlighted. They particularly criticize the influence of critical race theory and diversity, equity, and inclusion programs on the educational system. Government leaders are even harassing administrators and teachers who they believe who are practicing these approaches to education. This political environment is the genesis for this course. It will examine what critical race theory is, how it has been used, and its impact on public schools and universities. It will examine the criticism of critical race theory the efforts to prevent teachers to even mention it, and its impact on teaching about racism in the US. Our first speaker is Professor Paul Ortiz, who teaches undergraduate courses and supervises graduate fields in African American history, Latino Latin, Latinx history, comparative ethnic studies, US South, labor, social movement theory, oral history, digital humanities, ethnography, and other topics for the University of Florida Department of History. Professor Ortiz is the director of the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program. He also is an associate director of the Race and Crime Center for Justice of the UF Levin College of Law. And Professor Ortiz is uh, UF Chapter President of the United Faculty of Florida, which is playing such an important role today. 
and he's a longtime friend of ILR and has lectured previously on crit critical race theory for us. Thank you so much, Paul, and on to you. Thank you, Rick, and thank you, friends. It's so great to be back here again in person. You know, I had this tradition of biking out here. Um, my wife, Sheila, who many of you know, we live northwest 7th Lane, uh, just right behind um, the elementary school, which used to be called J.J. Finley, right? And we did a lot of work on that. It had now as, as, has a new name, but I, I was mentioning uh, beforehand to, to uh, Buddy Shorstein, uh, Rick Gold, and uh, Roy Hunt, who graciously took me out for lunch, that I think it took me a little longer to bike out this time than it did three years ago. I don't know, but um, I looked at my watch and I said, I should have been here about 10 minutes earlier. But anyway, it's just lovely to be back here in person. You know, I told Roy, I said, you know, I, I've done a lot of Zoom lectures, so I know I missed out on those free lunches, but when I was growing up, we had a thing called the rain check. Remember that? They said rain, rain check. So um, I'm gonna, I, I've kept a list of the free lunches that I'm owed. <laughs> no, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, but the last joke I'll make is um, I realized and I owe Buddy and, and Roy and Rick an apology because I violated a fundamental etiquette rule of all guests. And if you can imagine what that rule might be, I think it was Roy who asked me towards the end of, of, of our lunch, Paul, would you like dessert? Now, number one rule of a guest is you always say yes, because then that means everyone else can have dessert. Well, I said no. <laughs> so I apologize for that. Uh, I, we, we missed out on dessert, but, um, but this is a really important topic. It's a great series. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, ILR. Thank you, OCAMIC community for supporting this kind of work um, and kind of thought and discussion and dialogue, because that's what we're really trying to keep going at the University of Florida is debate, discussion critical inquiry, reading, um, you know, let's let our students have it out in a, in a seminar, in an undergraduate seminar, let's have it out in a town hall and talk about how we feel about these topics. Let's not allow the state to tell us what we feel about these topics. And that's very much what the state of Florida is trying to do today. In a few minutes, I'll, I'll talk about, uh, we'll kind of drill down into the heart of the state's um, uh, the education department's regulation against critical race theory. And I'll show you what I think is problematic with that, that law, what's contradictory, um, but it's simply repression. And I think we have to call out the repression. One of the, the anecdotes I can share with you as the president of the faculty union, and I just feel so blessed this is my third, and, and I've made clear to my colleagues, my third and final year as president of the United Faculty of Florida. Um, um, Jane is another one of our former presidents. So I want to give her a big th a thank you and shout out. It's not an easy job. You, you all know the phrase, some of you firsthand, that getting professors together is what they call like herding cats. Now imagine you have 900 union faculty professors, and it's like hurting like angry cats sometimes. Very, very opinionated, very exciting. But I remember, and there's, there's a lot of things memorable during my tenure, and one of them was the morning of October 13th, 2021, getting the call from Professor Dan Smith, Chair of Political Science, and telling me, Paul, three political science faculty have um, registered to give testimony against the state for the recent uh, voting rights law that they, they're, they're trying to pass. And the UF is, tr is trying to stop us from doing that. And I said, they're trying to do what? <laughs> you know, I was just like, oh, no. Um, and the word got out quickly that, that this was happening. But one of the things that we said in the union was, um, and I think some of you heard me tell this story before, but I, I want to remind everyone that we've never wanted one moment to embarrass or to make the University of Florida look bad at all. Because we are the university, you're the university, you built the place, 
we've all built a place together. And we begged the university, the Tiger to Hall, College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, let's take care of this before it gets out. Let's solve this. Let's work together. We're not talking to the media about this. Uh, but unfortunately, as you, you know, we couldn't get that done. Well, the day after October 13th, after I got the phone call from Dan, because word travels so quickly, and those of you who've lived here for many years know how shockingly quickly the news gets out here, that next morning I got a, a loud knock at my door. And again, Sheila and I live very close to campus. We're very easy targets for people. And uh, the person at the door was a dear colleague, retired UF faculty member, and who asked if he could come in and talk with me. I said, sure, you know, come in and talk and, you know, put on some coffee and we, we sat down and talked. And he said, Paul, um, you may not know this, but I'm Jewish. Um, I said, yeah, I do know that, that you're Jewish. He said, what I'm going to tell you is, uh, what I'm about to tell you is something I usually don't tell people who are not in our community. And so I was prepared to get a real important story if, if an elder tells you something like that you, you know you you listen as an oral historian or as anyone and he said here's the thing my family were from germany and as a boy growing up in the 50s and the 60s we would hear elders all the time talking about the cataclysm the holocaust the awful things and they would sometimes argue with each other and they would talk about, you know, and when we would ask them what they were arguing about, they would say, it's none of your business. <laughs> this is adult talk, you know, but he said, you know, we'd eavesdrop and as best as we can tell, they were replaying the events in Germany and Austria and Europe in the twenties and leading up to the thirties. And there was this agonized debate they had. And the debate was, could we have done something different to ward off this horrible evil? Could there have been some different chain of circumstances? Could, our, could we have taken different actions? And he looked at me and he said, Paul, how that conversation would usually end would be, maybe we could have done something in the 20s, maybe. 1930 was the last gasp, the last possibility. After that, it was too late. 1930 becomes 1931, 31 becomes 32, 1933, the only option is Exodus. He fixed his, gaze at me. He said, Paul, I want you to know what you're facing now. Florida is Germany in 1930. And you may not completely understand what I'm telling you, but if your generation doesn't fight back and hold the line, 1930 will become 1931, 31 will become 1932, and by 1933, it's too late. And so I, you know, by then I have, you know, tears, you know, come to my eyes. And I'm like, you know, I, we've got the message. We're going to hold the line. Because again, your generations of faculty, of staff, of students work too hard to build what we have to allow someone from the outside to tell us what we can think, what we can say. So it's just been so edifying to be at UF, great faculty senate, great support from the community, alumni, donors, retired colleagues, just, just incredible. So let me get into, um, I can tell these kinds of stories all day, but I realize I do have a presentation to share with you um, on critical race theory. And so, and I think, uh, oh, oh, thank you, Julie, for, do you want me to, um, oh, Perfect. Okay. Excellent. So yeah, for me, is that good for, for folks? Okay, perfect. So critical race theory is interesting. As a grad student at Duke, I read books on critical race theory 
I never took a seminar in the law school on critical race theory. It, this is a legal discourse. And it grew originally out of Professor Crenshaw's work with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, which is quite important to my family because my father was actually the chair of Hispanic EEOC at the Puget Sound Naval Shipyard when I was growing up. The Puget Sound Naval Shipyard is one of the world's great shipyards. And it, when I was growing up, we were the home port for the USS Enterprise, the USS Nimitz, uh, much of the Polaris and Trident class nuclear submarines. And the job of the EOC, if you're familiar with it, is to kind of mediate and mitigate and actually prevent um, discrimination. Uh, primarily in the American workplace. And Kimberly Crenshaw was concerned about these large examples of discrimination that would take place, not just against individuals, but whole groups of people in certain industries. Because the EEOC generally takes cases on, I guess in a legal sense, on, on, on kind of a class action case. They don't like, if you, you can call them, you can, you can file a complaint against your employer but they generally move when they get like 20 or 50 or 100 complaints about a particular employer. It could be a federal employer um, like the Puget Sound Naval Shipyard, or it could be a private company like Sizzler Restaurants, for example. And so Kimberly Crenshaw was concerned about the discrimination against especially African-American women in the corporate sector. And so she developed this idea of critical race theory as simply a tool to try to understand how racism happens, but also how we can dismantle it. And her, the, the belief, and it isn't just her, there are other um, colleagues or uh, professors, uh, Derek Bell from Harvard was another noted practitioner. He passed away um, several years ago. But the whole discourse is really about unpacking racism within institutions and then seeing what can we do to to end to end those those bad practices. So you, she began in employment, went quickly to policing, to other large kind of bureaucracies. And I mentioned there, there's a whole complex um, discourse. But essentially, you can boil critical race theory down to this central premise. The core idea is that race is a social construct, and racism is not merely the product of individual bias or prejudice, but something embedded in legal systems and policies. So when critical legal uh, uh, critical race theory scholars, again, primarily within the law con, uh, uh, context or the discipline or the journals began looking at things like, I mean, they wanted to look at things like the federal constitution. What is there in the federal constitution that either promoted or mitigated or prevented discrimination in any shape or form, right? Um, what is it within a large organization like a union that either prevents racism or promotes racism. And then again, most importantly, finding the structural causes of inequality that can be rooted out. And more or less what this means is that this is a way of looking at racism is not an example of, you know, whether I like or dislike, you know, Rick based on his background, but how the whole community interacts with Rick and I, and the idea that, um, you know, I could be very, you know, tolerant or welcoming of Rick, but what if the entire community is not tolerant or welcoming of Rick? What if there's laws that are passed that may not even have been passed on purpose that exclude Rick from participation as a worker, or as a resident or a student, et cetera, et cetera. So in, in general, that's the idea of critical race theory. And actually, it's really not that radical at all. The, most, the strangest thing I've read about these critiques of critical race theory, Governor DeSantis's office and Donald Trump's um, um, education people are very fond of saying that critical race theory is Marxism. 
<laughs> which is, I think part of our job, you know, part of what we can do, and, and I've given a lot of these talks in different parts of the country, but people say, well, what can we do? You know, one of them is simply to kind of, you know, pick up an article by Kimberly Crenshaw, read through it. She's a great writer, um, but kind of be, you know, I think we need to be on the lookout to challenge some of these ridiculous ideas, you know, one of them, you know, and, and, but then the other thing is, okay, if critical race theory is not Marxism, let's take that a step further. What's wrong with studying Marxism? Okay, it's a philosophy, it's a theory, millions and millions of people have studied it. So what's wrong with that? And that's something we unfortunately usually don't get to because there's an immediate crisis. And there is a crisis. A lot of my former students, and I hate to say this, but used to be school teachers in Florida. Many of them now are school teachers in New York or California because the harassment they face is so intense. Let, let me skip ahead to kind of give you an example of why K through 12 teachers are especially hard hit. So this is the state of Florida's educational rule against critical race theory. That's what it's known in colloquial terms, but it's really much more than an attack on critical race theory. It's much more insidious than that. And this is why it's becoming increasingly difficult to be a humanities or social sciences school teacher in the state of Florida. Because if you look at, I won't read the entire um, law, and I'll leave um, the, the uh, presentation, um, uh, Julian, so anyone can read it, it's, it's public access. But it, the attack here, the law here, the regulation is so vague by the Department of Education, and I believe it was purposefully written to be so vague, but at the same time, just really um, deviously destructive of intellectual integrity. Because what it does, one of the things it does is it equates critical race theory with Holocaust denial. Think about that for a moment. It basically says you're not allowed to use an entire curriculum, the 16, 1619 curriculum. Now, you may already have a presentation in the, in the works about the 1619 curriculum. Essentially, it's a new way of thinking about slavery and race in U.S. history. Do I agree with the entire curriculum? I don't agree with the entire curriculum of any you know, curriculum that's ever been published. There's, there's critiques of it, right? But the idea you would ban an entire curriculum is quite disturbing. And it's especially disturbing in the sense that some of my former students who are former Florida school teachers who are now very happy in New York and Wisconsin and, and, and Connecticut, especially, we lose a lot of people to Connecticut. I don't know why there's some connection there. Um, but one of them told me as she was leaving Miami-Dade uh, School District, she, she taught it, um, I think at Miami Senior. She said, Professor Ortiz, Ortiz here's the thing. All you have to do now as a teacher is mention the year 1619. You're not even talking about the 1619 curriculum. 1619 is obviously a pretty important date in U.S. history, right? But she said, all you have to do is mention it. And immediately the fear, oh, is she using the 1619 curriculum? And what she said is, you know, our principal no longer backs us up. It takes one parent or one student and one parent. It kind of reminds me of, um, we we had a lot of great sessions together, have we not? And one of them was about Kurt Vonnegut's Slaughterhouse Five. And remember the story I shared about the, um, the, the high school English teacher who was not connecting to his students. I think it was somewhere in Kansas or Nebraska. And his students were bored to tears. They just were tuned out. And so he got this idea, I'm going to bring in Slaughterhouse Five. And all of a sudden, the students got really excited. I think they're juniors or seniors, right? Just as, a, I, and I was so excited as a senior when I was in high school to read Slaughterhouse Five. What an incredible book. Um, and 
he said it turned on the whole class. Suddenly they started turning in their assignments. They started being interested in writing and, and, and reading. One student out of 33 or 34 told their parent, the book has some curse words in it. Okay, that's all it took. That's all it took. Suddenly it became a cause celeb. So I, I share that story and, and he ended up leaving and the school, uh, you know, a couple of school board members made it a very high profile case on their way to higher political office. But I, I share that story by way of saying that this issue has always been with us as Rick in your introduction, it's always been challenging to teach literature. Um, think about the fact that now one of the most heavily banned authors in the state of Florida is Toni Morrison. Think about that for a while. A Nobel laureate, one of the great writers in the history of this country, you know, the same people that passed this don't want people, don't want younger people reading Beloved. They don't want pe younger people reading Home or Sula. Why? Well, it, it's, it's, in, it's in the writing of the law here. So part of this is fine, right? We should teach about the Holocaust. We should teach about slavery, civil war reconstruction, Hispanic, African-American contributions of women. Great. But see, they had to say that because that's already Florida law. That's already in, in, in the education code. But then when you go further and it says how you're to talk about race, you're disallowed here, forbidden to talk about racism is embedded in American society and its legal systems. To me, that's a critical clause there. And you skip down instruction must include the U.S. Constitution, Bill of Rights, subsequent amendments. That's great. Obviously, you do that. And especially if you're teaching U.S. history, obviously, it's a no brainer. But this idea that they're telling us how to think and talk about race is the part that's obviously really problematic. What is it about our discussions about race they don't want us to talk about? Well, they don't want us to challenge their power, their authority. This law was passed in the wake of the Black Lives Matter movement, which was a national and then international movement and an effort to try to get the nation to look in the mirror about our history and to, to do something about it, essentially. Again, a great opportunity to debate, to not always agree or to agree to disagree, but this law takes even that out of our, our, uh, our purview, uh, out of our ability. So what's wrong with this idea that um, racism you're not supposed to talk about racism as embedded in American society and its legal systems. Well, first, racism has been embedded in our legal system and in our political institutions. To me, as a social movement historian, the most important part of that story, though, is not just to talk about how it was embedded. You know, those parts of the U.S. Con of the federal constitution that upheld slavery, the Fugitive Slave Act, et cetera, et cetera, but how people struggle to change those things. To me, that's the great drama of U.S. history. And that's what they're trying to take away from us. But if you go into looking at some of these, um, and, and we've, in, in previous presentations, I, we've talked about some of these individuals but this idea that the state has, that the U.S. was founded on universal principles of truth and justice for all, it just isn't true. It would be nice if it was true, but it just isn't true. Insofar as we believe in universal ideas of justice and equality now, those are things that our ancestors fought and bled for. I remember one day, she and I were driving someplace, and it was the anniversary of women's suffrage. Sheila, some of you know, won the Susan B. Anthony Award last summer. It was really exciting. We went, we were going to the, um, 
going to the reception, but I think it was two or three years before that. The Susan B. Anthony reception here is held on the anniversary of women's suffrage. And we were listening to a radio station and the announcer said, this is the day that the federal government granted women the right to vote. <laughs> I was like, no, 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 no. We we're like, no, 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 no. The federal government didn't grant women anything. They fought for the right to vote. Women were tortured or waterboarded because in the late 19th, early 20th century, the women who said, we want the right to vote, the state thought that they were either insane or terrorists. They were beaten in front of the White House in broad daylight. The federal government didn't grant them the right to vote. That was the process of struggle. Oh, and did you know the only committee member or the only state legislator, as far as I know, Sam Proctor would have known for sure. Um, the only state legislator that we had in Florida in 1919 who supported women's suffrage, William DeGrove. Does the DeGrove name sound familiar? Um, one, it was a struggle, okay? So not founded on universal principles, things that had to be struggled over, the people in power, well, you know, let me go back to, to um, well, Charles Francis Adams, obviously, the family, John Adams, John Quincy Adams, et cetera, et cetera, doesn't believe in universal principles. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to pick on these, these gentlemen. Um, I'm just trying to make an obvious point, which was that the people that ran American society in the 18th, 19th, early 20th centuries by and large, didn't believe in universal principles of freedom and equality. They believe that certain people should be in charge of the system and other people should follow the follow their the orders of the people in charge of the system. And Andrew Carnegie was no different than Adams and all the you know, Rockefeller. Um, this is from a previous presentation that we did together on literature. This could be the pop quiz. I'm not going to read that, but the, you know, there are so many visitors to the U.S. in the 19th and 20th or 18th and 19th and 20th century, and they would find great things to talk about, um, usually until they went to the U.S. Senate or the Congress, and then the story would change. Um, but this is a reflection of Charles Dickens, who was shocked and saddened at the state of American democracy in 1842. And he was especially shocked at the fact that Congress people, uh, we should just say congressmen, they're all men, were forbidden to read anti-slavery petitions. Forbidden. And, and this, this horrified Dickens because he was part of a transatlantic abolitionist um, community. So he was very disappointed. Um, he talks a little more about here, but I'll, I'll kind of skip over this because um, I want to get get moved towards um, a little further down the road. Um, the, anti, the abolitionist movement, the women's movement, the civil rights movement, the Black Lives Matter movement, all of these movements are trying to bring into being a world where we're all welcome, a world where we all have a place at the table. You know, a world where we all have a stake in the system, where we're all treated with dignity and respect. And the labor movement in the 30s and the 60s, we can make decent wages and have pensions and things like that. None of that was granted. It was stuff that was all organized. We had to organize to get. Um, that's the book I'm working on now is it's called A Social Movement History of the United States. And over lunch, I talked a little bit about it and I said, you know, one of the case studies is the Great Depression. You know, I'm a big fan of Frances Perkins. She was a giant. She's a giant in American history. Uh, first female labor secretary, but genius in how she approached public policy related to labor issues. Um, Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, People in the 30s larger than life that are rightfully in U.S. history textbooks. 
But what made them move? What, who created the new deal? And that's what I'm working on now. My argument is that, that, that energy from the grassroots, the people in the streets, you know, being in New York again, Sheila and I were in New York over the break. Uh, it had been our aspiration to be there last Christmas for her 65th birthday. We missed that because of the Omicron surge. So we got there this time. I took her to the NYU's main downtown building by Washington Square. That building is in the home of the former Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. Remember that terrible episode in U.S. history? And what women workers had to do to make safer workplaces. Not something granted by their employers or by the government. Women themselves had to fight to make those workplaces safer. These are things that the statute against critical race theory, these are the conversations and, and the kind of learning that is, is being erased, is being deemed as being too controversial. And that, to me, is the most devastating part of this. When Frederick Douglass here, and, and this is one of the toughest critiques of the U.S. government I've ever seen in my entire life. I mean, it's it's a incredibly tough, rigorous critique. Douglas was asked in 1862 to by a group of people in National Hall of Philadelphia, obviously one of our iconic meeting places in U.S. history. But he was asked to talk about the coming of the Civil War. This is the second year of the war, and it's just occurred to people this is going to be a long and terrible, terrible, terrible war. And they asked Douglas to talk about the causes of the war and to focus on the perfidy of the Confederacy. Mr. Douglas, we want you to give a pep talk, make us feel good about fighting a good fight against those terrible Southerners. And there's one thing you learn about Frederick Douglass from an early, early point. If you want a speaker to come to your event, and you want that speaker to make you feel good and laugh, don't invite Frederick Douglass. <laughs> invite someone else, right? Don't invite Mr. Douglass. So Douglass is looking at this audience of Yankees, and he's saying, I'm not even sure why you brought me here, because you brought this cataclysm on yourselves and on us. You could have avoided it. You decided not only to placate slavery, but you profited from it. And the profit was too much for you to let go of it. And this is why we're in this terrible war. And this is a tough, tough critique. And this would not be acceptable under that state law because he's talking about systemic prejudice, institutional prejudice. Slavery wasn't, see, if we, if we, if we taught slavery, like if you said to me today, Paul, you got to teach the history of slavery by the statute that's that I just shared with you, I would say, well, how am I going to do that? I would have to teach slavery as an individual individual choice of every single slave owner who ever lived and died. Who on earth could do that? <laughs> that's ridiculous. The law is ridiculous. But what, the flip side of this, which I think is equally important to remember, is that at the same time that Frederick Douglass is formulating this incredibly powerful critique. He's recruiting young, young men to go fight in the Union Army in the Civil War. He loves his country so much, he's willing to sacrifice his own children. His sons fought in the 54th or the 55th Massachusetts Infantry Regiment. This person who loves his country but loves his country in such a way that he's like, well, my country does bad. I've got to talk about it. We've got to talk about it. And that's all that we're, I think we're, we ask as teachers and as students is the ability to let's talk it over. Give us the freedom to talk about critical race theory. If it doesn't work as a theory, we throw it out. If it works, we'll keep talking about it. Give us the freedom to talk about the 1619 
history curriculum. If it's absurd, it'll just fall by the wayside. But when the state goes to ban and censor something, it creates a backlash. My high school English teacher, I shared this with you when we, when we read through William Faulkner, Richard Wright, and all the others. He tricked us, he would say, first day of class. Well, you're not going to find Slaughterhouse-Five in the library. You're not going to find it in any bookstore in, in Bremerton, Washington. I don't think your parents want you to read it. I was on the next ferry boat to Seattle, Washington with a group of my peers who were, <laughs> we were not honor students, but because he said, oh, well, it's not in the public library, you know, it might have some controversy around it that led us to want to read what's this book and not just Vonnegut, but Sylvia Platt, The Bell Jar. Our school board didn't want us to read Sylvia Plath. Our school board didn't want us to read J.D. Salinger. There were sexual scenes in the, those books. We lived in a shipyard town. We never heard about sex. <laughs> they used to say, my mom, my mother married my father. She married him at noon and graduated from high school at 6 p.m. Typical for a shipyard town. Can you imagine the school board saying, we don't want the we don't want high school seniors reading about books that have sex in them. This is what happens when the state starts to do things like this. Anyway, I, I realize I'm beginning to do the like a history professor ramble or something. So I'm going to try to get back on point and then wrap it up because um, I, I want to hear what what y'all um, what we think. Um, but really, just to kind of sum up the problems with the state of Florida's rule, which is called the anti-critical race theory rule, but which I've argued is, is so much more, is that to understand historical events, the big events, and one of the great re documentaries I've seen in recent years, how many of you have had the chance to see Ken Burns's The U.S. and the Holocaust? Oh my gosh, just stunning, amazing, heartbreaking but to understand the holocaust or any of these big big events civil war reconstruction you have to understand that the forces leading to them were embedded in the society ken burns's argument is that the u.s failed to become that sanctuary that we want to see ourselves as as, as being because our society was shot through with eugenics, anti-immigrant hysteria, race laws, many of which later are imported into Nazi Germany. It's tough love that Ken, Ken Burns is giving to us, but it, it's a lesson we, we need more than ever. Why do we not live up to our credo in that terrible moment? But to, to, to dig down into that, you've got to get past the rhetoric, right? You have to get past the idea of the most democratic nation on earth. That doesn't really help any, doesn't really help me understand what happened in the 1930s with the U.S. and the Holocaust. And this is simply reiterating the theme you know by now in our, our sessions on literature, on, on, on great authors, on, on history. My view of history is that it takes collective, collaborative struggles to change things and to understand that we started in this whole hemisphere as an anti-Semitic and racist hemisphere. I mean, how could we not? I mean, the Spanish lead the way in the conquest. The thing that unites the Spanish kingdoms is the expulsion of who? The Jews and the Moors. And the Europeans bring those ideas to the New World with them. So it's not surprising that we still grapple with them. To but to pretend they didn't bring those ideas with them 
is just a, a, a foolish fantasy. We had to fight to change those, those levels of discrimination. Um, this is simply a reiteration of the bill. It's the same, it's just in a different kind of, um, and again, I, I just want, you know, as we get to thinking about what can we do in this moment, part of it is remembering what we already have done. So I've been a historian, well, I've been a history professor for about 21 years now. It's really, really amazing to me um, that I've been so privileged to live this incredible life. But I can remember when I started doing research on, on the Ocoee massacre, that's one of the things I've done a lot of research on in, in Florida. You didn't talk about that. I remember the first time that a group of community members in Ocoee invited me into Ocoee to take me to the place where black people used to live before they were physically driven out on election day, 1920. And they begged me, Mr. Ortiz, I wasn't a professor then, I was a grad student, don't tell anyone you're in town. Don't tell anyone you were here. Because if you tell anyone you're here, looking into the Okoe massacre, it could have devastating effects on us here. Remember, Okoe was a sundown town for many decades and was just coming out of that nightmare in the 1980s and 1990s. So you couldn't talk about it. So what did we do? Or what did they do in Orange County, Florida? That was, I think, 1996, the first time I visited Okoe. Midnight, 2010, I got a phone call. Retired Colonel, Army, Army Colonel Bill Maxwell introduced himself as chair of the Human Relations Commission of the city of Okoe. Paul, would you consider coming here and giving a lecture on the Okoe massacre? for our MLK Day celebration. I told Bill in subsequent years, I almost hung up the phone. I thought, <laughs> this is a crazy, this is one of my friends from grad school pranking me, right? Someone from Ocoee is gonna call me and ask me to give a lecture on the Ocoee massacre in public in Ocoee? It was true that it was real. And so I did, went down and gave the lecture, it was an incredible experience. And, but again, a testament to how the people of Ocoee had grappled with that issue. They ignored, I mean, if the critical race law had been passed back then, they would have had to have ignored it because they had to acknowledge that racism was embedded in the fabric of Ocoee, every aspect of Ocoee for generations. But they were sick of that and they wanted to find a way out. And they came upon this idea of historical truth and reconciliation. And that's what we're doing now in Alachua County. Some of you have been active or, or know about the work of the Alachua County uh, Remembrance Committee. And I've had the great privilege to be able to work on writing some of the, the, uh, the, the text for the markers, commemorations of lynching. Okay. Does that make some people uncomfortable to have those markers there? Yes, it does both black and white people. And we've had a lot of dialogue about why we think it's important to, to put up those markers. And, but it's been an incredible part of the, of improving this community. I believe the great work at Dudley, the great work that's happening at the Matheson history should be controversial. Y'all, you all, we all know this. I'm speaking to the choir. It should never be boring. goes to the statutes again. And I think you all know kind of what our, our take on this in the United Faculty of Florida, our Article 10, and this kind of gets me to the end, which is the beginning. I see Article 10 really as, and, and, and most, and, and many of the founders of the union, the way they taught the younger members, those of us who arrived here in the 90s or later. And I remember Anand Vera, great scholar, of race uh, and critical studies telling me, Paul, Article 10 is the gem of our union contract. He said, there's a lot, yeah, there's stuff about wages or salary or working conditions, 
but this is the centerpiece because and I remember he told he told my grad students I had my grad students interview um, a lot of the founders of the union and they said and, and a lot of the founders would say um, <laughs> you can't imagine what it was like to be here in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s you could be fired on the suspicion of being lesbian or gay we had faculty fired because they criticized Robert E. Lee in public. But here's the thing, our students and faculty and staff and community have turned that around. They've challenged that kind of repression. They've agreed that dissent is a critical part of the tradition of our broader community and the campus in particular. And we're going to do everything we can to defend that tr those traditions of dissent. Senator Ben Sass found it out very quickly. I think he was surprised, but I also think he was edified at the end of it. We talked about this in the lunch. At the beginning, he came to campus, and the words were transformative, revolutionary, turning us upside down. And a lot of, especially, we had a lot of retired faculty who told Tiger Hall very clearly, we don't need to be turned upside down. We don't need a revolution at the University of Florida. Can we improve? Can we do things better? Sure, you can always improve. But again, we've worked so hard as office managers, as chairs, as junior faculty, as grad students, as parents to build this place up. We don't need that transformative leader. We need someone who believes in what we do. Okay, now, now I'm on a different speech. Sorry about that. I'm on a different speech. So let me get back to back to this. Um, this is what we do as union members, but you don't have to be a union member to uphold these basic principles. All this is really saying is that we as a community and a collective bargaining agreement, it's not just pertaining to the union. This is binding on your employer. If you have a collective bargaining agreement, and you're a union member, this is you, but it's also your boss. And we look at this as very important because it requires the university to recognize that intellectual freedom is always going to be under peril in this society, and really any society that I know of. It's always going to be contingent. There's always going to be people who don't want us speaking out there's people who don't want us mentioning terms like global climate change, sea level rise, natural selection, et cetera, et cetera. Rose tell me you went to Dayton, Tennessee, uh, not too long ago. The wonderful movie in the Scopes Monkey Trial last week, uh, Inherit the Wind, uh, was on, on, on the television, a great reminder. But the university recognizes that internal and external forces may seek at times to restrict academic freedom and the university shall maintain, encourage, protect, and promote academic freedom. To me, that's all of us. That's what we can do. And I'll just conclude by saying that when people ask me, you, folks in the media will say, why is academic freedom for you so important? And part of my response is a personal response. And that personal response is, as a first generation college student, I do look on what, uh, I do look on my job as a professor as part vocational coach. I want my students to get jobs. Yeah, I want them to become great critical thinkers and, and imbibe these great traditions of, of intellectual freedom, et cetera, et cetera. But at the end of the day, if I'm not helping them become gainfully employed, I just don't feel like I'm doing my job. I would feel very bad. And the thing is, is that we should be using the same material in our classrooms, in our science classrooms, in our social science classrooms, in our humanities classrooms, as the best classrooms in the country. And if you go to Harvard, I have a lot of dear colleagues from grad school who teach at Harvard or Princeton or Cornell, they all use Kimberly Crenshaw. They teach Derek Bell. Some of them use the 1619 curriculum they study critically to, as part of their PhD training in sociology or anthropology or whatever. 
And so the idea that you want to limit my ability as a professor and tell me, oh, you can't assign these books to me is insidious on so many different levels, but even on the level of vocation. If I'm writing a letter of recommendation for a former graduate student, I can't say that, oh, by the way, exempt <laughs> Joe because he wasn't allowed to read critical race theory because we're in Florida. Can you imagine how unemployable that person would be in the academic job market as competitive as it is? So anyway, I'm, I feel like I'm starting to ramble again. Um, so I will kind of wrap it up here and just thank you all for being such a, a kind and indulgent audience and um, take questions. Thank you. Yes. Um, before we start, I just wanted to take advantage of the time to remind people that tomorrow is our next session of critical race theory and the politics of teaching about racism. And it'll be at 10 a.m. tomorrow with uh, Professor Kevin Brown. And uh, I, had, I sent out uh, the document that he put together about participating in the origins of the development of critical race theory. Let's start with our question from Anne-Marie on Zoom. Go ahead, Anne-Marie. Um, hi. Um, I've probably asked you this question in another forum before because I always want to hear what you have to say. And I like to see how uh, your point of view has grown and changed over the years. But um, I think what you're asking um, us to do or what we're asking Americans to do is something that is extremely subtle and um, small scale and cultural in terms of, um, you know, how we begin to dismantle all this controversy around critical race theory. And, and let me just say, I think that um, you, you've really made very clear that critical race theory is at base a struggle for power in contemporary society, you know, which groups can benefit from scarce resources. So I think that what motivates the people who are against the teaching of CRT um, are um, those who, you know, they say that um, uh, racial minorities uh, are benefited too much from the last four decades of affirmative action and this hurts um, the white majority and um, so the the backlash is really um, fueling anger of low income disadvantaged white individuals. And I think that's exactly what's being targeted here. Um, so my question is, you know, what, what can we do to decouple the teaching of race from all this backlash promoting um, narrative um, that uh, is being spewed out there in the larger society? It's a big question, but, uh, you know, I'm really interested in you talking a little bit more about that. Yeah, it's a, great, it's a great question, Emery. And one of the things that's so exciting to be a teacher now and to be someone who just, you know, has an open, tries to have an open mind and, you know, you're getting older and I'm, uh, you know, I, I talk to my students sometimes and I think, oh, Paul, you just become a, a stereotype of the aging curmudgeonly history professor. Um, I, I try not to do that, but, but, but I think sometimes that's okay to do that. Um, the exciting thing here is, and this is going to be an odd way, seemingly an odd way to answer your question, is that the people who are really, let, let me start from the, the bottom up first. The, the constituency I see that's really driving and motivating and pushing us to change American history curriculum is not the professors writ large. You know, it's not the people in the higher ed, it's the high school and middle school students and their parents. And I know this because, and, and this is gonna get back to the backlash. I know this because I work with a lot of school districts across the country, in Connecticut, in Maryland, in Florida, in Wisconsin, in Indiana, and in some other states. And I engage mainly with uh, school assistant superintendents. And they tell me quite frankly that our students are demanding 
a new kind of curriculum. They want more inclusion. They want more diversity. They expect that women should be front and center in U.S. history. I wish we'd had that when I was in high school. I don't remember coming across seeing any women mentioned unless it was what, Abigail Adams? It, and Betsy Ross, right? The high school students today are very different. They're demanding something more rigorous. I'm not saying this is uniform, right? Because I only work with seven or eight school districts, but some of them are really big school districts. One of them services about 500,000 students. The one I work with in Maryland, um, 200,000 students. And, and that school district, the assistant superintendent that I've worked with, and she uh, is, is retiring, uh, I think, this coming year, but she told me very, very plainly, um, Professor Ortiz, in our history curriculum, you've got to give us people who look like our students at all levels of the curriculum. Well, who are your students? They're increasingly Puerto Rican, Dominican, Ethiopian, Eastern European. Can you provide a new cast of characters to bring into the story? I make it clear to people, I'm not getting rid of Thomas Jefferson or Madison or all the others because they, they belong there. But there's, well, what's the place, or what's the old phrase? There's uh, the rendezvous of victory. There's, there's room for all, right? One of the things the superintendent said, the only caveat, Paul, as you're bringing these people in to, to talk to my teachers and the teachers' workshops, enough with Alexander Hamilton, please. <laughs> We've got Hamilton, no more Hamilton. You know, we'll, we'll do a Hamilton moratorium kind of thing. He can be in there, but, but no more, yeah. The songs are great and everything from the musical. Um, but see, this is coming from the grassroots. And as the superintendent was retiring, well, one of the last, uh, the, I, I went out there last summer to do a workshop. Every time I go to this high school, I have to say this, because now this will tell you where it is. It's actually Rockville, Maryland. Every time I go there, the air conditioner fails in this room with like 70 teachers. But one of, the super, one of the top education officials there told me, he said, Paul, I'm just so happy now because our students, I used to walk into our classrooms and social sciences and the humanities, and the kids would have their heads on the table. They're just tuned out. But now with this more diverse curriculum, they're interested. They're like, oh, that, per oh, that person is a, a Hispanic surname. Oh, there's, there's a, a young woman there who's making history. Oh, you know, it doesn't always work, but sometimes it does. So the reaction, getting back to the reaction, that's part of what the reaction is, because there are some people who don't want the narrative to change. They don't want more women in the curriculum. They don't want more people of color in the curriculum. They don't want more working class people in the curriculum. The people promoting that, though, are really, really wealthy people who have a lot of resources, a lot of money to spend to pack, get any of this legislation passed, not just in Florida. Remember, that's a model bill. If we had more time, I would talk about the similar bill in Texas, the similar bill in Arkansas, the similar bill even in California. Did you know that a lot of the funding for this comes from Southern California? Some of it comes from New York City. And when I go throughout the country and, and lecture, people will say, oh, Professor Ortiz, I feel so bad for you in Florida. What a terrible place. I'm saying, no, no, don't say it. It's a great place. A lot of this is from outside of this. A lot of the force of, of the, this stuff is coming from out of the state. It, it's, Ron DeSantis made a statement in, I think for the first time in Wyoming, and then he made it in Idaho and then in California. And it was something he was proud of, obviously. He kept repeating it. And the statement was something like, why should a truck driver have to pay for gender studies? And he apparently got a big rise out of whatever audience. But remember, the audience are not poor people. They're not the people I grew up with, primarily white, 
Hispanic working class people, they're wealthy people. Because this is also, and Anne-Marie, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give one more anecdote here then I'm gonna stop. Part of what I do also is I lecture, this is odd for me to even admit this. Some of you, as soon as I admit this, you're gonna think, God, Ortiz is such a sellout. <laughs> I give a lot of lectures to corporations, y'all, about these topics. Um, Hispanic Heritage Month, Black History Month. I give lectures, I give lectures to like Deutsche Bank International, Bank of America, Guggenheim Investment Partners, the list goes on and on. It's important work, I believe, even though I grew up with a working class background, very anti-corporate, it's important work because I think changes are happening within corporations that we need to be a part of. And Anne-Marie, getting back to your question, this is behind that, this is the force behind that phrase, woke capitalism. Think about it, woke capitalism. Because there's a battle within the American ruling class over everything we're talking about now. Think of Andrew Carnegie, think of Charles Francis Adams. The battle within the, within the ruling class is these big corporations are saying, we think we need to change a little bit here. It's funny how the end of my lecture at, at, at a corporation usually is very scripted. There'll be a talk, a Q and A, and then on cue, the HR VP jumps up and says, well, Professor Ortiz, we'd like to ask you, how can we get some more of your University of Florida students to apply to our firm? The doctor is in. They're asking a very important question. And, and they know that these struggles are going on, but they want to be more inclusive within their structure, okay? And I think we have to be as supportive as we possibly can. Does, does change happen for corporations? I kind of doubt it, but they're having the dialogue. The groups that are inviting me are affinity groups within these big corporations. The, the um, um, what was it? One of the big banks, the, per, the, for, the, the division that invited me was like the, the money laundering division of Bank of America. I didn't know there was such a division, but they're looking for our students. They want our students to apply and, and they want to show off and say, hey, Professor Ortiz, we're more diverse now. We're more, dare I say it, woke. That's the battle happening within the American corporate sector. And that's why I think so many very wealthy people are pouring money into these repressive laws. I can tell you when I go back home, the working class people that I grew up with and know, they don't care about this stuff. They have no, um, not one iota of interest. They don't care about gender studies. They don't even know what it is. I don't want to make them sound ignorant, but that would have been me when I was 18. I didn't know what gender studies was. So the idea that you can, you can kind of um, brainwash someone to be against what's happening in the university, it, it can happen. I'm not saying it, it's impossible. Anyway, Amory, I apologize because I'm on another tangent. <laughs> Paul, let's take our final question from Jean okay. Gerard. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, one of the groups that you mentioned was women, and I'd like to remind you and everyone here that women are still not equal in the Constitution. Yeah. They added black men in 1965, but we are still not protected by the Constitution. We are still have an Equal Rights Amendment that we would like to pass that people should understand. No, and meanwhile, women are losing the right to determine their own health care. Mm -hmm. They're losing the right to vote in a lot of places. I think maybe, I don't know what it takes to wake people up. And I know you've had the same problem. Uh, but anything 
can happen uh, in women's rights uh, down the line, along with uh, legislation like what you have shown us today, that will deny us all kinds of positions that we fought for. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. I mean, no gain. I, I should have. Uh, you're exactly right. I agree 100 percent. And what I should have added in, in my presentation was every gain comes about because of a struggle. But every gain is always contingent. It's always vulnerable. I mean, the, mis the mistake my generation made was and just to kind of give an overarching, like too broad characterization of my political generation was, you know, we would have political meetings over different things. And, um, you know, someone would say, well, you know, uh, Roe v. Wade is, um, it, will, it will never be overturned, right? It was, per, you know, there's a sense of now that we've made this, you know, or, or the Voting Rights Act is safe, you know, well, what a wake up call we've had. Um, what we should have known all along. Um, and you're right. I mean, the, the struggle to pass the RA, the, I mean, even in Florida, I've mentioned women's, the, the 19th amendment here wasn't ratified until when the sixties, Oregon actually revoked the 14th amendment and only re-ratified it when someone pointed out, Hey, you know, Oregon, <laughs> Oregon, do you ratify the 14th Amendment? So, I mean, but all these rights and, and, and things are, are always, they're, they're just so fragile. Um, I was actually in, in D.C. the day that Dobbs B. Jackson, the, um, you know, the ruling came out. And I was in the National Archives. And we, we heard the announcement. And, you know, the, a bunch of us, you know, packed up and, by the time we got to the Supreme Court, of course, it was ringed with police and you know barricades and barbed wire and everything. There were about 10,000 people there protesting and a lot of younger women with their mothers, a lot of families saying, you know, we've got to, um, well, obviously something tr terrible has happened in this country's history and we have to acknowledge it. Dobbs v. Jackson is a terrific, it's a horrific tragedy in American history. And I think you have to, I mean, I would just connect it. And again, um, you know, I'm doing the history ramble thing, but all of the things the Supreme Court has done in recent years, Sonia Sotomayor has done so much to try to, you know, again, wake people up to say that you have a group of people here who don't really care about the society and they've said it very clearly and I don't know how more, much more clearly they can tell you they don't care about your opinion they have an agenda one of them blames liberals for all of his problems he's made very clear that he's going to spend the next the, the, the remainder part of his life to punish liberals so Sonia Sotomayor says, how much more clear can it be? You all need to like get going, <laughs> right? So anyway, um, yeah. Paul, I think we could listen all day, but Rick Gold, do you have final thoughts? Not at all. Thanks so much for a really impassioned speech presentation, a well-researched and a really a good start off to our course. Thank you so much. Thank you. Excited about the rest of the series. Thanks. Thanks for doing this. It's just great to be back here in person again. Can we get dessert now? No, no, I'm just kidding. No, no dessert. <laughs> if Sheila finds out, I'll be in big trouble. No dessert for me. Thanks, everyone. Bye.